everyone, and welcome to the Resilience Through Artivism with Elizabeth de la Cruz Santana. This is the first presentation of the Artivism Fellowship Program guest speaker series, a program run by AFSC, sorry, letters are hard, <laughs> Pan Valley Institute in partner partnership with Fresno State Department of Theater and Dance. My name is Maria Torres, and I'm a fellow of the Artivism Program. I'm working along with the three, my three other fellows, Meche, Ariana, and Cecilia. Us and many other talented Latinx youth are producing a film project surrounding the stories of California's Central Valley. Our guest today is Elizabeth de la Cruz Santana. She is the daughter of immigrant parents from, I might butcher this, Jalisco, sorry, <laughs> Mexico and a fifth year PhD candidate at the University of California, Davis, working towards a PhD in Spanish with an emphasis on human rights. As part of her jurisdiction work, she has coined the childhood arrivals critical theory framework and the term childhood arrivals diaspora. These are the concept that inquires about the forced explosion of our childhood arrivals to the US through the deport. Deportation, ah, sorry, <laughs> approaches. In the summer of 2020, as an Imagining Americans Leading and Learning Initiative, Fellows for the Melon, Melon, I'm sorry, <laughs> Public Scholars Program, De La Cruz engaged in the research of public scholars' experience in graduate programs. Today, we will hear more about the Plas de Tijuana mural project and learn more about Elizabeth. My team and I will be asking Elizabeth questions about her and her work. There will also be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So you could, when that portion comes, you could send questions in the chat box and Elizabeth will answer. So thank you for joining us today and let's get it rolling. All right, perfect. And thank you for that kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully everyone's able to see it. Um, I do have some visual images that I think are very relatable to that topic uh, for tonight. So as the title for this presentation is Resilience Through Artivism, and I switched out the, the, art, the art, right? The artivism aspect and added in that art because I think it's really important to emphasize that through art, we can always become art um, artists, but also activists and combine um, that and to make something like the Plaza Tijuana Mural Project happen. Okay, so for those of you who may not know me, my name is Liz de la Cruz Santana, and I go by Liz because I think it's shorter for people, and that's just the easiest way for, for me to also represent my identity. I am currently a UC Davis PhD candidate and a Fresno State alumni, so I received my BA and my MA in Spanish Literature and Culture from Fresno State. And my formation in both institutions have shaped much of the work that I currently do on testimony and storytelling and has specifically inspired the project I will be speaking about today. And here I have a few images of the Plaza Tijuana mural project. The latest one uh, you could find in your bottom right side and that was taken in October of this year. As previously mentioned, I am the daughter of immigrant parents from Jalisco, Mexico, and the granddaughter of Racero grandparents. My family's history with migrating to the US, making this country their home, and the current mixed status of my immediate and extended family have allowed me to experience the effects of their immigration status and the lack of a document that protects them from becoming deportable. My dad is also a childhood arrival, and his migration story has become the inspiration behind my scholarship. For this and many other coming of age experiences, the research focus of my doctoral studies not only take an academic lens, but a personal one, which seeks to not only question and document our country's long history in deporting immigrants, but to suggest policy recommendations to ethically and humanely treat the community my dissertation focuses on and to advocate for restoration and justice. Okay, so in November of 2016, exactly after the 2016 election, I found myself in Playa de Tijuana, and I'll show an image here. So you can see the border section, and 
basically this space for me was very impactful and I'll share a little bit of why. I have a short video to basically Okay. So as part of a week-long training on digital storytelling at Colegio de la Frontera Norte, the humanizing deportation research team was taken to different spaces in Tijuana. I was taken by the existence of a barrier of this kind, not only separated both countries, but also imposed itself on this border town. I grew up crossing the border on our way to Guadalajara, Jalisco, especially during the summer. But now as an adult and coming into this location as a researcher, the questions and reflections that arose have formed the basis of the Plaza Tijuana mural project. The research team was also taken at night to Friendship Park in Playa Tijuana in 2016. There it was impossible to miss the art painted of the border fence. There were many images and messages painted, yet the message was up to the visitor to decipher. There was no description to guide those of us who found themselves there for the first time. Luckily for us, a professor from El Colep accompanied us and shared as much information as he could. I compare this space to the Altai border point where you can see crosses honoring migrants who have died attempting to cross the border. Again, besides reading articles on this space in Altai, our taxi driver educated us on the importance of this installation and the history of how the wall was constructed. Yet part of the message was still communicated. Whoever painted here was taking back this wall, was reclaiming this space, and were transforming through art a wall that is connected to violence, death, human rights violations, and the attempt to prevent migration and enable the expulsion of an undesired immigrant. One of the murals that impacted me the most was the Veterans in Distress mural that includes the upside down American flag. So this one you could see here. And as you can see, it has the names of veterans who have been deported who swore oath to defend the US. I question how can a military veteran who fought at war or conflict be deported? Something is definitely wrong with using deportation as a punitive punishment, especially for this population. So in 2017, as part of the humanizing deportation team, I spent my summer in Tijuana. There I continued to document the border and basically was really in the field and learning a little bit more about what deportation is like. So as you can see here, these two images, Let Us Cross and 10 Years, were some of the images that stuck to me. The first image made sense given the context, yet the second was given meaning through the voices of the people who shared with us their stories and experiences with deportation. Through our community narrators, I learned that 10 years indicated their punishment, their castigo, after being exiled from the country most perceived as their home and where their family, culture, and life connections remain. And besides that, as you can see here, I have images of Border Patrol, and this is a very hyper-militarized area as well. And for me, it was just very shocking to see how a border town lived with this in a constant, you know, constant day by day. So that summer became crucial in understanding the experiences of a community of immigrants that were somewhat forgotten from the immigrant rights movement within the United States, media and academic scholarship. Their authored digital narratives for the archive allowed for not only the research team to become familiar with the myriad of elements that triggered their deportation, but also to document life after deportation as experienced and communicated by them. As my advisor Robert Irwin communicates in many of the humanizing deportation public presentations, community storytellers are the knowledge creators. So considering the previous mention, the narrative aspect of digital storytelling has given life to a narrative path that gives life to abstract art and spaces, such as the ones found at the border. There is some danger, danger in trusting people to enter very specific spaces and expecting them to have a meaningful encounter with the contents that are there or to walk away with the message intended. Although for this specific context, we can expect people to come in with prior knowledge and might not require the creators of the art to explain it to them. Yet for me, presenting art without narrative 
fails to create impactful consciousness and action-driven participatory change. So with the hopes to eliminate the possibility that people may not understand what they are looking at the border in the intended manner, the Playas de Tijuana Mirror project creates a path to edu educate people about deportation through the stories of people who have been impacted by deportation and portrays painted and these portraits that they themselves painted, right? So I wanted them to also have authorship and to have this possibility to also paint how they see themselves. In this sense, the Playas de Tijuana Mirror Project engages in a narrative work and connects the dots through art and digital humanities. So now considering this, the Humanizing Deportation Archive hosts many stories tied to deportation. From these, my research centers on the stories told by childhood arrivals. This population is widely known as the DACA recipients and the dreamers. Yet as my research suggests, this definition is limiting and excludes many others, especially those who have been previously deported before the implementation of DACA and those whose DACA eligibility criteria excludes. These observations led me to question who counts as a childhood arrival, revealing then the real childhood arrivals. For this reason, stories such as Jorge's are crucial to magnify the impact of deportation on childhood arrivals who were taken to the US as children. A culture to the language and society, speak English and have little to no familiarity with the country of birth. Jorge's story is one of the 300 digital narratives that accompany the portraits of the mural. I would like to emphasize an argument he makes in his narrative, which guides the objectives of the mural project. In this specific point of his narrative, Jorge is communicating the moment where he is speaking to an immigration judge. So I'll be playing the audio so you can hear his voice instead of me reading what he's saying because his voice is present in this narrative. And then I'll add a little bit of an analysis. I try to fight my case and explain to the judge, you know what, Your Honor, I've been here since I was eight months old. I had no idea I was undocumented, but if you give me the opportunity, I will fix my status. But there was no way to fix my status. I'm not from the U.S., but Mexico doesn't consider me part of Mexico either. I had no country. Nobody wanted me. Or okay. And you could always view his narrative. It's in the Humanity Deportation Archive as well. So Jorge, as he tells us, was taken to the U.S. as a baby. He grew up knowing he was born in Mexico, but did not understand the legal implications of this. He states in his narrative that he attended U.S. schools and even graduated from high school. He would recite the national anthem at school and was in the process of enlisting in the military. But then he was deported. Unfortunately, Jorge was criminalized by local police multiple times, not only in California, but in another state where his sister lived. And due to his undocumented status, he was deported at age 18. After an unauthorized reentry, he was then taken into immigration custody where he fought his case. As he communicates, there was no path for someone in his circumstances to legalize his status in the US. And I would add that there is no path currently. So his story is one that echoes the experiences of many others. And for example, Tana, Tanya and Isaac who were portrayed in the mural project. So Tanya was taken to the US at three years old from Jalisco, Mexico. As she communicates in her narrative, she and her family became deportable due to an attempt to legalize her status in the US. They were ripped off by unethical lawyers who took advantage of the family. The immigration judge ordered their deportation, and as a result, she navigated coming of age undocumented and learned to navigate her early childhood and adult years with a deportation order. Her deportation not only caused her expulsion from the US, which is the only country she knew, but it also triggered family separation. Her daughter was left behind and she, was ex she had experienced and continues to experience communication difficulties and is yet to see her daughter in person. So she's about to I think this year she already met her 10 year bar. So just imagine being 10 years away from your daughter. And then we have Isaac who was taken to the US at six years old from Oaxaca, Mexico and quickly assimilated into US life. He recalls feeling like a sponge and learning the language and culture. He was deported on his way to church at a border patrol checkpoint. 
he communicates how he was targeted, racially profiled, and verbally abused by the border agents. Although he was first told he was free to go by one of the agents who inspected him, another um, basically took the decision to detain him and take him into custody. As one of the border agents said to him, congratulations, you are the first person we get for the month of June. That moment would dramatically change his entire life. He was deported to Tijuana where he had no family, did not speak the language and did not have any familiarity with the city. Although this was the city where his family crossed to the US. As he states, he felt like a foreigner in his own country. As with many of the stories that make up the mural, the stories I've briefly shared demonstrate the human impact of the long lasting effects of deportation and the lack of a comprehensive and adequate approach to the US childhood arrivals dilemma. I invite you all to engage with the stories, to listen, not only to imagine ways to support those affected by deportation, but also create possibilities of care and active support. As a researcher and someone connected with the community I am collaborating with, I questioned the limits of my engagement as a university student and often found myself dealing with the guilt of listening and knowing the stories of those who have confided in us. Many would consider our work as something innovative and admirable, yet I felt that I was not doing enough and that simply hosting and archiving stories was not reaching its full potential. Often in public presentations, attendees would ask the team what other forms of engagement we were pursuing besides documenting. And oftentimes stating that the aim of the project at this time was to create the stories did not feel enough. So taking into consideration these circumstances and these feelings of guilt amongst others, I decided to find resources in the university that could help solve this at some capacity. Although I value the process of creating stories with community, for in fact, it has allowed to create public knowledge on deportation, I seek to challenge the research component and to engage in reciprocity to give back to the community we were collaborating with in some way. So this was made possible with the UC Davis Mellon Public Scholar Scholarship that I got last year. It became the support I was seeking. The fellowship helped clear some of the issues I was navigating and it allowed for a creative project of this kind to come to fruition. I worked alongside Maro Carrera, lead artist of the project who also became my community mentor. Enrique Chiu, who facilitated the space at the border, and Mancel Montoya, who became my faculty advisor for the project. In 2016, after seeing all the art at the border, my intention to have a mural that related to the work we were doing in humanizing deportation manifested. Um, three years of Phil's work in Tijuana, and now with the support of the fellowship, a mural that would engage the community we were collaborating with became a possibility. I had known Mauro Carrera from several art events in Fresno, and I mentioned the idea of creating a mural in Tijuana early on in my academic journey at Davis. We just needed the funding. And that funding came through. This fellowship offered a generous stipend which helped cover the cost of painting materials, meals for the entire team, and travel costs. It became seed money for a project that continues to live its intended working period due to public interest and the desire for the community to communicate the work we began. As you're able to see in the clips, the portraits were painted by the storytellers and volunteers. We all engaged in nine days of painting sessions and Ricky Chu, the artist behind the mural de la hermandad, offered his studio in Casa del Tunnel where all the portraits were painted. The method you see here was introduced by Mauro. This method allowed the participants to become artists themselves and specifically for storytellers to continue authoring their own stories and self-representation materials. This was an important aspect of the project. I did not want an artist to simply come to the border and paint stories of interest, but rather to facilitate, once again, the tools for the community to continue telling their stories. As some official painters, we became Rascuache artists, using the tools we had to make this work. This time, not only with the digital stories, but also through their own artistic work. As we were not working with a traditional surface, but rather on a fence made of cylinder shaped poles and empty space, we had to be creative and install the portraits on this canvas. After the portraits were done, we had to cut them up into strips that, and then position them on the border fence. We worked from the eyes outward to make sure we did not lose the essence of the image. 
In a way, having this interrupted and disjointed surface allowed to send additional messages. The portraits can be seen um, depending on where the viewer is standing at the beach and the images are disrupted because these are complex and multifaceted stories. Additionally, as the materials used allow for the mural to exist for about 10 years. The environment conditions such as the sea salt and weather secured for about five years. The erasure of the stories also communicate the erasure of the stories beyond the boundaries of the border and take us to consider the invisibility surrounding the experiences of childhood arrivals to the US and ones returned to their country of birth. We completed the first phase of the mural between August 1st and August 9th. We installed six of the seven portraits we intended. I later returned in September to add in the seventh portrait and continued working in Tijuana to restore and maintain the mural. This was made uh, specifically possible with the support of Tania Mendoza, Robert Vivar, both part of the Humanizing Deportation Archive and Ulises Rodriguez, who is an asylum seeker from El Salvador. So, in January, we had the Estrada family help in the restoration of the mural. As Carla communicates in her narrative, her brother was previously deported in 2017 and her parents decided to leave the U.S. to help their son in his return to Mexico, as he was taken to the U.S. at an early age and was unfamiliar with Mexico. The family had not seen each other for about two years, but through the mural project and a support group Tania and I began called Dreamwell, they were able to reunite through the Mexicali and Calexico border point. This was one of the most meaningful moments that happened because of the mural. And it was an attempt to give back to those who have shared their stories with the public and the humanizing deportation archive. So as mentioned before, my desire to have a way in which visitors at the border point could have guidance in what they were seeing was crucial in this project. The implementation of the QR codes became the answer. Once visitors scan the codes with their phone, they are directed to YouTube and the narrative of the narrator starts to play. After listening to the story, they can then make the choice to share with their networks. In this way, not only are they listening to the stories, but can also engage beyond that and help bring awareness to the issue. As this is one of the most visited spaces at the border, my hope is that folks portrayed on the mural can get legal help. For me, their cases are simple but I'm not a lawyer. They just need the right support and I know that exists. I acknowledge that not everyone can visit Tijuana for many reasons. As a way to bring the mural to more publics and spaces, I digitalized the mural in PDF form. The digital mural has been used in K through 12 university and law school classes and continues to share their stories of childhood arrivals. And then you can see the PDF version here. I have it in English and Spanish as well. So through the mural, I hope folks can not only consider the stories of DACA recipients and the dreamers like Carla and Jairo, but also understand that the way our criminal system and immigration system works allows for military veterans such as Andy de Leon to be deported. Although he had permanent resident status, he was still deportable. I want people to understand that deportation only affects the person who is being deported, but it also, um, has enduring effects on their children. So it goes beyond affecting the person being deported. Such is the case of Montserrat and Tania. Deportation in their cases complicates their roles as mothers and oftentimes denies their motherhood. I also want people to understand that before their original DACA version was instituted in 2012, other dreamers were previously deported. And that this type of relief or any other relief introduced has yet to include those who have been deported but still meet all the eligibility criteria versions of the DREAM Act and others proposals introduced. I also want people to understand that childhood arrivals are not simply defined by their immigration status or lack of status, but that they deserve a life with dignity and equal opportunities to their counterpart US citizen neighbors, friends, and family. Additionally, I want people to understand that not everyone that gets supported has a criminal record. Some are criminalized by institutions and society, that even those child arrivals who do hold a criminal record should be given the opportunity and pathways to make up for their actions. An additional point of suggestion is that the receiving country, in this case, Mexico, to implement useful programs to facilitate their incorporation and to consider the hardships in assimilating to a country foreign to them. For this reason, the mural was painted on the Mexican part of the border. 
And this issue not only pertains to, US, to the US, but also to the Mexican state as well, who I feel oftentimes remains silent about the issue. So in conclusion, my intention with the mural project and my dissertation research is to eliminate deportation as a punitive punishment for childhood arrivals and for policy of this population to also consider those supported and who have self-repatriated. For those of you who joined in before the webinar and were able to see the introduction part of the Plaza Tijuana Mural Project documentary, my intention is to translate my doctoral dissertation to the public. To make my findings as accessible as possible, the mural project became the first step and now I'm con continuing this work through other audiovisual platforms. Now in COVID-19 times, I am finding creative ways to continue working on the mural project and show the faces of those affected by a country's immigration enforcement policies. So in this image here, you can see the people who have been part of the mural project since 2019. And I'm hopeful that the new set of images and stories could also be a part of the mural in 2021 if COVID restrictions allow for this to happen. So I'll close with one slide, which I think is really important to also communicate ways to support our community narrators. So for example, we have the Veterans for Peace um, org, which if you basically support them, they support the deported veterans, not only in Tijuana, but in Mexicali and Juarez. And then we have the Dream World organization that Tania and I started and El Faro, which is a border church that basically supports a lot of the migrant community in Tijuana. And I've also included the LinkedIn of Isaac Rivera, who is a coach. He has many businesses. He's just trying to make it in Tijuana and the YouTube channel of Agent 559, who is Jairo Lozano, who is currently in Fresno as well. So I'll leave my information here in case you wanna learn a little bit more about the Plaza Tijuana Mural Project. This is my contact information and I'll wrap it up and we'll start with the um, Q&A. And thank you for the time and the space. Okay, sorry if it gets a little nosy and noisy in the background. I have nieces and nephews. So thank you again for that wonderful presentation. It was very, oh my God, inspiring. And I love seeing the work that you have done. So now will be the Q&A part. Uh, shoot, I can't find this today. I think I have a question personally is like what inspired you to like paint these certain people? Like why were these people chosen? Yes, thank you for that question. I think that I always get this question because I feel that people wanna know why, right? Like how did you approach them? Did you know them prior to even starting this project? So everyone who's painted on the mural project is someone that I know, right? So I met them before either like for example, in Carla's case, I never met her in person, but I worked with her brother and her mom before they ended up going to El DF and just relocate and start a new life there. So everyone else that is part of the mural, I've met them since I started my field work in Tijuana and others I knew in Fresno, like Jairo, who's you know uh, really known here in Fresno because of his work with youth and also because of his music. So I knew Haido and I knew he was a DACA recipient because he's very open about it. Um, and then, uh, for example, the Dreamer Moms, uh, Montserrat, I worked on her narrative in Tijuana and everyone else was someone that my advisor worked on their narrative. So for example, Tanya, Isaac and Andy were narratives created by my advisor. So in many of the different locations that I went to Tijuana, I got to know them personally, even if I didn't have the opportunity to work on their narratives directly, we still created a bond. So now that I do go to Tijuana, I see them all the time and we just catch up and they became really intimate friends. So it moved past the research stage into more of like, we are friends and we just really care about each other. So the reason why I picked people that I knew was because I wanted to have 
really strong communication with them in the sense of letting them know what I was thinking about in regards to the mural. To also note that because they are on this border point of the border section that people will most likely recognize their faces. So I didn't just wanna take these portraits that were priorly taken by one of the photographers of the Humanizing Interpretation Project, but to have their, you know, their yes and saying, okay, yes, I wanna be extremely public about my story and have, you know, my face on the border wall. So I wanted to make sure that they knew what that meant. Um, and it's a conversation that I feel we have going on based on the digital component of the stories that people can find their narrative on YouTube. And that's a very public platform as it is. So we wanted to make sure that with their faces now on the border that they feel comfortable that kind of, in a way it's like they're outing themselves to whoever's going to this space to say, yes, that's me, I'm an immigrant or I had a life in the US, but then I was deported. So it's not the case for everyone who's been deported. Um, like um, one of the stories here with John, he was able to return. So John is one of my intimate friends from UC Davis. So I met him there in school. So it's just easier for me to have a connection with them than to ask strangers or other narrators from the archive to say, hey, you, would you wanna be a part of this? Because I wouldn't feel comfortable either in doing it. Yeah, so thank you for that question. Yeah, because honestly that does take um, like a lot of guts to like publicly show your face, especially on a giant like what, six feet <laughs> tall pole. Uh, so another question we have is, what was your favorite part or moment in the process of doing the mural? Yeah, so for me was, I think the studio moments, I guess when we were all painting together. So for example, my relationship with Tanya before we started the project was more like on Facebook. And I met her one time at an event that I had to cover my advisor for in Tijuana. So it was a, a conference. She went with the other Dreamer moms and I knew of her. So it was like, okay, a face to the person I'm, talk I'm talking to on Facebook. Okay, perfect. But during the studio time, uh, we were both painting her portrait. And, you know, when you're painting, you're just like reflecting on life or they start talking about what that moment means for them. So I feel like our bond became even stronger. And she's now one of the people that in Tijuana I consider like my family. So in that case, I feel like that moment that we shared in community became one of the most, I guess, fulfilling aspects of the project. And those were not things I was expecting. You know, it's just, when you are drafting a project, at least in my case, it's just, okay, this, these are the materials I need, location, how do I get from point A to point B? But the human relationships were not something that I was expecting as much because I, I didn't know it was gonna happen, to be honest. So when I have that now, it's just so meaningful. And then the bonfires we would have after we finished painting, those were amazing because you know you're just sitting there by the mural and you're just, you know, taking it in and talking about your experience. So those moments with community, I think, were the most um, fruitful, at least for me. Perfect. Uh, okay, we also have another question. Uh, they said, why was Isaac not painted on the wall? I'm guessing they're talking about the fence pole. Was he painted last? So Isaac's face, so at the beginning, we didn't expect to have Isaac on the border wall. We wanted to paint his face. And I think it was an idea that Mauro had to include him and have him in another place in Tijuana. So maybe like another wall, because in Tijuana, there's so many murals there. And if you're just driving by the highway or walking around Revolución, you would see different murals. So our idea was like, how do we get people to the border part where we we're working on the mural? and then have Isaac's face there because his face was smaller at that moment, right? So at the end, we couldn't find a location. We were like, you know what? He deserves to be with everyone else. Let's keep him there. And yeah, so his face eventually became part of the mural project. But even if his portrait was not there, his QR code where, where people could scan it was part already of the mural. It was just an idea that we were playing with and getting people to the, to the border point here. But you know, just, I guess his face has gone through so many unfortunate things through the mural. And I'm not sure if you were able to tell in the, one of the first images, um, his face was specifically on a board 
that was just there already prior to when we got to Tijuana. So we pasted it there. Something happened, I guess the weather was just really rough in December of last year and his face disappeared. So we had to paint him again. And now he's one of the first people starting from the ocean side towards the land. So if those things do happen, we consider them as something that, okay, we could paint them again, nothing bad happens. It's just restarting from, from zero in that sense. Uh, Mecha or Cecilia or Ariana, if you have a question, you could definitely ask. Sorry. Uh, I have a question. Hi, everyone who's watching. I'm Meche. Um, I'm one of the fellows uh, for the activism. Um, and so I have a question about just kind of everything that's happening right now in the world. Um, there's a lot of movement, um, especially even movement of the demographics of the immigrants that are coming into the U.S. Uh, so a lot of that is shifting as far as now is a lot of Africans and Africans coming into the border and creating uh, that culture within the Tijuana border. Um, but a lot of us have known the narrative of immigration to be one of Mexico and Mexicans. Um, and so recently there's been a lot of light shed onto the, the destructive um, things that the U.S. have done in terms of like civil wars, ecological collapse, and Africans that uh, kind of push them to leave um, their home country. And so my question for you is what is the important, what do you think is the importance of gathering stories across the globe to paint an accurate, an accurate depiction of U.S. imperialism, including those um, who exist in the diaspora, those who exist in the Central Valley, in uh, the U.S., in Los Angeles? And I know it's a loaded question, so sorry. <laughs> no, I, I love that question because Obviously, I feel at least in my case and throughout the work that I've done is that stories add on to the what we call the official story, right? In quote, unquote. So whoever makes that official story happen, what we read on books or what becomes the official narrative, right? From the nation, for example. But I feel like stories, like the personal stories, play a counter action into stating, well, maybe that did happen based on that perception, but this is what really happened. And this is how my story adds onto the official um, truth. And I would add truth because what is that truth, right? So for me, adding the stories of the people who are directly affected by whatever topic it is, right, is so meaningful because their experiences should be, and I feel like should have always been the source of information that we should consider to create the official documents of history and to create like policy recommendations. And if the U.S. does have interventions in, for example, El Salvador or in Chile, which was I, which was the case I study at Fresno State, is that why are we not learning about that directly from our nation, right? Why is it that, I, for example, in my case, I found out about Chile once I was in undergrad at Fresno State. So why didn't I learn about this when I took AP Spanish in high school, right? So why are we hiding the truth of what really happened to the people who were impacted or marginalized? So in that sense, I feel that if we listen and we pay attention to the people who are being affected, we are actually really learning about a wider scope of what's going on. So for that, reason I feel like digital storytelling is one of the tools that we could consider to gather information. And what I love about digital storytelling is that it doesn't have to come from an institution like UC Davis. Like anyone who learns how to do digital storytelling or right now with TikTok or like with social media, you just learn how to do that really quick and make it happen, right? So if you have the tools to do so, and I feel like youth have that already, then why not use it for something that would probably create social consciousness of what's going on. And I would say that we don't have to wait for someone else to come in to that community to say, hey, this is what I think you need. And these are the tools that you need. And I have them here for you. But to see what is it that they want, right? And to actually listen. And if they say, no, I don't want that project because that project's not really going to support what we are currently going through, then we should, you know, as the outsiders, 
be very open to say, okay, well, how can I help you? Instead of us saying, well, this is what I need to do because I'm a grad student and I need to get this project going. But to actually look into that. So I hope that it kind of answered that question. But I think it's really important to also consider that yes, people are being forced out of their countries and they've had been, you know, experiencing this since decades, right? So I think that my research focuses more on the Mexico relationship just because of my family ties and the Bracero program is one of those examples. But I mean, being in Tijuana and just seeing different, you know, different people from different types, you know, walks of life and just learning that at the end of the day, they were forced out and all they want to do is have a chance at making it and whatever that making it means. So we just can't, at least for me at this moment, it's like, okay, after I finish this PhD, let's expand to what's also going on in different communities because it's all important. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Hi, Lizbeth. Um, my name is Ariana. I'm also uh, one of the Artivism Fellows. Um, I was born and raised in Tulare County. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and ella. Um, and you touched something that's like really important. I work um, outside of, the, of this fellowship. I work in education, and I'm a mentor for um, Fresno youth in uh, specifically middle school. And um, you like the Central Valley is like a 400 and like 50 mile like um, area, right? And we have like a diverse population here but a lot of like the policies and politicians are very like anti-immigrant so I was kind of had a question like do you see yourself doing something like that in the Central Valley just because like we know we're here like we know there's a lot of immigrants here but there's this very like state of amnesia that we're under and I think it's like you know having trying to like assimilate or like trying to just like survive living in the U.S. so like I would think it would be super dope if you were to do something in the Central Valley because you know, like there's always that narrative that there's like the brain drain, like everyone that, you know, you know, comes up, leaves and then kind of like nothing, you know, kind of gets moved forward here. And it's like as someone that's been like doing movement work since um, college is like super difficult, <coughs> sorry, super difficult to organize here just because of like the dominant, like oppressive culture that we have here. Yes, I love that question. <laughs> just how you, you know, like the book that you use for it, there's enough impressive culture for sure. And my idea before the Plaza de Tijuana mural project, you know, of having a mural in Fresno and specifically in Fresno State, you know, happened because I was going to Art Hop since I started college and I knew of Art Hop. That's actually where I met Mauro and like other artists um, here in the Central Valley. So I was just taken by all their work and, you know, why are we not doing something more? Why are we not, you know, uniting forces regardless if there's any money for us to get paid for our work? And I understand, you know, having people being paid for their work because that's important. But when we all share like a, you know, a vision that will impact our community or in some way create a bond that will unite us all and then move forward with whatever it is that we need to do, then that's more important, at least in my, my point of view. But I mean, I've been trying, trust me, I've been trying, especially this year. Um, I had, you know, the chance that I had to kind of let go. Um, so National Geographic approached me to do a documentary on the mural project and my work as a university female student uh, who's doing work at the border. But I couldn't find the support in Fresno to make it happen. So it was the month of August, if I'm not wrong. I was just, you know, making proposals for Arta Americas, who was very receptive. So I really definitely appreciate them. But I wanted this mural to be in Fresno State. And I had like all the visuals ready. And I wanted to replicate something similar to Chicano Park, which is in the San Diego Barrio Logan area in, you know, by the border. Because that space, you know, is like the home for so many, has so many histor historical roots. And I feel like Fresno deserves something like that, that we, we have all the tools, we just need to do it, right? And unfortunately, it always comes down to who's gonna lead this? What am I getting out of it? Why is it a girl doing it? And you know, I'm being super honest here. And it's just, why is it that a university student feels that they have the guts to even approach, you know, people in higher ed, even if it's my alma mater or, you know, whatever space that I, I was looking into. So for me, it just became this power politics that I, nav I navigated here while I was at school. 
and I still push forward, right? But it just becomes very unfortunate that at the end of the day, it's like people try to get, what am I going to get out of it without looking into why this project is something that might support us. So um, I'm still going to (laughs) try because I don't want to give up on this project. And now that I even have like the blueprints for it, but I just want to find a home for the project. And I have the funding through a fellowship that I got. So the money's just waiting there, but I don't have the support here in Fresno. So for me, it just became this thing. Well, you guys all shared the mural project and, you know, you would say that, well, Fresno State alumni did this and that. But when it comes to the, like the actual work, we always get the no. And COVID was one of the main reasons that, ha- you know, that was one of the rulings, but you don't need a lot of people. So you know, it's just being creative and making it happen. But I think when people are not interested in, to listen to what your real project is or your vision, then they're going to stop you, which was also my experience with the mural project. Like people thought that this project was just so big that it wouldn't be possible, and especially because it was like my first art project. And, you know, in academia, it's always like, well, the academic should stay in academia and you shouldn't cross into other spaces. So I still pushed through and we made it happen. But in this case, I would definitely love to have that. So we'll see. But I think, you know, you bringing it up also makes me feel that it's needed. You know, and this is what people want. Yeah. Um, Hi, Elizabeth. I'm uh, another fellow. I'm Cecilia. Um, I'm actually um, mixed, so I am part um, Mexican, but I'm actually um, Native American. So I'm actually from the Yilkut tribes here in the Central Valley. So um, my question is like, do you think if you get like allies from different peoples within the Central Valley, if you if you were to come to the Central Valley and do a project like you did there here, um, do you think you could um, maybe reach out to other people who feel hopelessness? Because I know a lot of the Native American in the Central Valley they feel very um, hopeless because, you know, we were here, then we were relocated, we got moved. Um, so I think it's like, if you're going to do a project, I think if you extend your um, arms out to other people and communities around you, I think they would help. But do you think that would be a good idea for you or how could you approach that? Yeah, I definitely love that because, you know, I feel that the no's always push you to the yes, right? So a door has to open eventually. And I just read one of the comments that was posted here that why don't I project, you know, the under the space at the freeway by San Pablo and Belmont. And honestly, I feel like this person knows, <laughs> could hear my uh, my thoughts, but that was one of the spaces that I was thinking about before even making it part of an institution, which is always like a problem with my, with the work that I want to do. Like if you make it part of the institution then they kind of own it in some way, or they call the rights over it. So if we make it in the city, and that was something that I engaged in conversation with another artist here in Fresno, but I guess a project had already been proposed for that and it never happened because it goes back again to how much money the artists are going to get paid and all those things. But for me, it's really um, important to engage in collaboration. And I feel like if I find the right people or like the right people approach me, then we can make it happen, right? Because at the end of the day, it's just, let's just do it, you know? And it's a good way to, even right now with COVID, you know, taking the precautions that we need and stuff, but working outdoors on a mural is possible. So I think that if anyone's interested, or you may know of anyone who has like a wall that we could use, then that's perfect because the Central Valley does play a vital role in not just feeding California, but to, you know, we have a large immigrant community here. And then we have like the kids of immigrants, which is my case as well. So, and I I think, um, Ariana, you mentioned that you know, it's always this idea that once you finish school at Fresno State or in Fresno City or, you know, um, Fresno Pacific, we always leave and we don't want to come back to the Central Valley. But I want to change that. I want us to come back and give back to our community. Regardless if I was born in LA, I see Fresno as my home and not so much Compton anymore. So I think that we come back and whatever it is that we learn outside our communities and bring it back to make our community better, then that's perfect. So I'm definitely open for that, Cecilia. So thank you for bringing that up as well.
so Lizbeth, we have some things going on in the chat. Um, we have Gina, who is also a, a professor of theater in at uh, CSU Fresno. She said that y'all should link up and talk. Um, and then Lydia said, you already know that no is not an option. I would like to help you um, make the mural happen in Fresno. So you have some people hit, like wanting to link up with you. <laughs> so make the, those connections. And then Lizbeth, um, when did you move to the Central Valley? So I moved right when I turned 15. So I just had my quinceanera in Compton and we moved. So I started my sophomore year in Hoover High. And since then, um, I finished high school, went to college, um, MA and BA. Yeah, and then I moved in 2016 to Davis, but now I'm back um, because I'm doing a fellowship. So I'm in Fresno since December. Well, Fresno and Tijuana, but here. Okay, that's dope. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of share like your experience, kind of like maybe moving into the Central Valley and like if there was like a different like... Like if you had like a culture, like a culture shock, you know, of like how things are here um, and specifically with education. So like, I kind of want to know your experience, like in like the like LA school district versus like the Fresno school district and kind of like just your experience in education in general. Yes. Yeah, so I grew up in Compton, but because, you know, I mean, people know what Compton is, right? So my parents decided to, um, for me to go to school in the next um, city, which is language. So I went to school there, elementary, uh, middle school and high school. And I, I always remember this one class specifically because we had to take the state test. And our instructor, she was great. We learned, but we learned with fear. And I did not enjoy that because I've been one of those people who enjoys going to school, learning. I've always been like the nerd kid in, in class. But learning like that was not healthy for us. You know, even till now, I still remember that feeling of like she calling us and if you didn't know the answer, you don't go to recess or you don't go to your next class. And it was just kind of like, well, how am I supposed to learn? But we learned with fear. So, and I understood at the end, the end goal, right, was for our school not to get close. So it was our middle school. So, you know, growing out with that idea of like, wow, like our schools are not well funded and we get whatever we get. Yes, we're investing more in policing and security and because there was always fights, right? And I, that's where I grew up. So now coming to Fresno as a sophomore, first I was very upset that I had to leave all my life behind in LA. Um, I had a boyfriend then, my best friends, and I was class president. So for me, it was just like, I had to start new in a place where I don't know anyone. So we, I started school, I was in the honors classes, but I didn't fit in. I was one of the only Mexican American um, students there in, those, in that program. And all the Mexican kids were in the other classes, the normal classes. So it was really hard for me to make uh, friendships that way because I was put in with the smart kids, right? The smart kids. But at the end of the day, I just figured that you know, separating us like that was not helpful. So, you know, in school, I mean, I tried to really learn and everything as much as possible, but I felt like there was something missing. And what's missing is really learning our stories and to really see what is it that we need, like the support we need at home. Um, especially in my case, my parents didn't finish like high school. Like my mom, my mom only went to like third grade um, and she had to repeat that same third grade because she went to school in her rancho. So there was no teachers there. So it was like one teacher teaching like everyone from like kinder to sixth grade, which was my experience when I moved to Mexico in 2000. So I was, my sister, my brother and I were in the same class, all of us together with our cousins and everyone. And one teacher was the teacher for everyone. So yes, I learned a lot because I had to take, make sure that I was, you know, being grounded like that. But at the end of the day, that's not the best situation. So in Fresno, I always felt like there was something missing. But I do appreciate the schools that have like the dual immersion classes that teach English and Spanish at the same time, because then it allows us to have a connection with our parents and to say, this is my homework. You don't have to help me do it, but I at least want you to know what I'm you know, doing. And now in higher ed, the same thing. It's just how do you translate your work and what you're learning to your family? when maybe you're the only one in college. So 
I think it just starts from like elementary and like your home schools to really help students feel comfortable with what they're learning and to do something with it. So in my case, I'm, I have the, you know, the privilege that my family supports me, even if they don't know what I do as much as possible, they just know I go to school and I do this and that. But I think that their support really helps me feel comfortable in saying, well, I'm just going to go and do this right now and just be more proactive in that way. Thank you, Lizbeth. Um, I'm also, you, you speak a lot about how your family um, comes from like a history of, of being part of the Bracero program, um, as well as like having a strong hold in within the Central Valley, um, I assume because of that. Um, no, like, and also you being able to experience the Central Valley the way you did, like, how do you feel that that Bracero program shaped the culture of the Central Valley? And how did that reflect back into your work, um, especially currently um, as the Central Valley is? Like, how do you feel like everything is connected in that way through history? Yeah, so I feel that it's really important to always remember, you know, who was here before us and before our generations, like our ancestors. So in that case, like when I learned that my grandparents were braceros and then actually understand what that meant, right? So for people who might not be familiar with it, um, for example, the bracero program would hire people, uh, like specifically men from Mexico, and they would inspect them. And that was another thing that I learned in college and teaching these aspects as well is that they didn't just say, okay, you meet our eligibility criteria, you're going to get hired. But then they would be treated like animals, right? So they were, they would be sprayed uh, with these pesticides. And I remember my, with my grandpa, it's like they had to take all their clothes off and then in, be in a room with all men and a doctor inspecting them. And then if they got the okay, then they go on to the next phase of that Bracero program. And then once they were here, they were all treated nice. Um, I feel that sometimes that's what's missing in the conversation is that the U.S. didn't receive them with, you know, arms wide open and welcome them here. But instead, it's just we just wanted them to work. That's what we call them braceros, like manos, brazos, right? So just do the land, work the land and then, you know, go back. But many of them decided to stay or they had families here. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that our ancestors were pretty strong in, you know, and I will say it in Spanish, like I want that or to tolerate all of these things like the hatred or racism that they were facing. Um, and specifically like the males for like, for instance, in both my grandparents who already passed away, like I remember them, they were very silent, but then they would joke. So it's like that. I would say like that silence in their essence, I think comes from trauma that they experienced here in the US. So both my grandparents did work in the Central Valley at some point. And I think it's really important to emphasize that us moving to Fresno also communicates that, what about my, my parents? Where are they working? What, what is it that their day-to-day -day looks like? And can they really communicate that to me? Because you know, growing up in Fresno and like going to work with my mom or, you know, her having to talk to white folk, it was so like disappointing to see um, like her entering different spaces and then people treating her as less because she didn't speak English. And then we have someone who is Mexican American acknowledging that they don't speak Spanish when they do. So I think like even if our own people don't treat our, our people, our community well, then why do we expect someone else to do so? So like all those little different elements growing up in Fresno really allowed me to grow with like a lot of anger, but not as anger that would stop me from like moving on to do more. But I think it's really important to see, okay, well, what spaces do exist for us to engage in community? So for me, like the art world here in Fresno was really meaningful for that. Um, I would say like the downtown area for sure. And then also the, um, the theater that is in Chinatown here in Fresno was really meaningful. And then they also opened their, their doors for different cultural events. So I think finding those spaces um, are really important, but I think that we still have a lot of work to do. And at least from my experience, it seems that everyone has their own organizations and then they only collaborate with X amount of people and they don't move past those circles. So it's really hard to break those barriers and actually have like 
a collective effort um, to create that community with people. So I'm not sure that it really answers most of your question, but it's really interesting, you know, living in Fresno, but at the end of the day, it feels like more of an individual experience. And then you have like these pots of communities between people from like different nationalities. Thank you. Yeah, you definitely answered my question um, about your perspective. Um, so Gina, um, the theater professor from CSU Fresno wants to make a few comments. So I'll pass the mic to her. Hi, um, can you all hear me? I don't see myself popping up in the in the thingy. So uh, thank you so much for this uh, absolutely beautiful presentation, but more than a presentation, of course, this amazing project that you are presenting to us today. Um, I wanted to just uh, take a, a minute of, of our time together to make a, just two comments that I'm, I'm noticing here and I think are important. The first one is that um, your, your work really shows us that our life experiences are worth studying. Um, our life experiences are uh, material for scholarship. Right, um, and uh, just uh, by hearing you talk and um, sharing the the stories of these people, I um, uh, I wrote this down: restoration and justice are only possible through the in depth analysis of our life experiences. Right, if we don't have those life experiences, um, how can we actually interpret what injustice is? Um, so I, I want to thank you for that. I think that that is just so incredibly valuable um, and something that uh, traditional scholarship always overlooks um, because of this uh, official narrative that you um, so, so well uh, pointed out. And then the other comment I wanted to make is that you mentioned that, um, you know, uh, the process of making the mural was sometimes triggering uh, to to them, right? Because it's their story and it, it makes them relive uh, those moments and also what happened to the family. Um, but at the same time, it documents, right? And you, you mentioned that. So yes, it triggers, but it also documents. And the act of documenting those stories actually allows the rest of us to bear witness, right? And I think that that is such a important concept here. Uh, the, uh, you know, whoever, runs into your mural is bearing witness to these stories. And it's so cool that you added those quotes and that they can go and see the video because it's like a living museum, <laughs> like a free museum in the middle of the beach. I just, I thought that that was just uh, fantastic. Um, and then lastly, to not steal any more time, just wanna let you know, um, I am a new professor at Fresno State. Uh, I'm fascinated by your project. I think that, uh, you know, I would love to talk more to you about it and absolutely see if I can be an ally in your process of um, seeing we can do something like this in the Central Valley. So thank you so much for your time. I will pass it over now. Thanks. Thank you so much. And yes, definitely like the museum aspect of, you know, bringing this mural to the beach was what I was intending. So when I first went to Tijuana and specifically here Plaza Tijuana and I encountered this border point and I realized that it was empty. No one was painting here. And it was really hard to approach because it's just not easy terrain to, you know, tackle right away. But I think it's really important to use this space to communicate the stories and to do so in a ethical way or like as best ethical way as possible and to not miss the shot of allowing people to really understand what's going on. And something that I learned also in painting at the beach was that, you know, the visitors who would walk around us and were just there seeing what we were doing and why we were painting this one person there is that some of them ref saw themselves reflected on the mural. So then they would share to us what happened to them. And some of them, I remember one specific lady who said that she feels like if she didn't, wasn't able to get permanent residency, she would have been in this mural as well, or would have seen herself deported to Mexico, but then she got lucky. So I don't want people to feel like they just got lucky. Like there should be a pathway for them to, you know, make themselves American citizens, especially if they were raised in the U.S. So I think that's really important to acknowledge that a lot of the pathways don't really exist. And what do you do when they don't? So you make your own. 
So in this sense, I think it's really important to really look into the stories and learn from them and see what they are suggesting for us to do, which I think it's really missing from like the larger narrative that we see in like the media. Thank you very much for your intel. Uh, so we have eight more minutes for Q&A portions. And one question from the audience, Robin, they are asking, President-elected Biden is expected to sign an executive action to protect DACA, my God, recipients. Are you or your collaborators connecting your activism with legisla legislators and legislative possibilities? Yes, so Robert Vibat, who I hope will be a part of the mural project for next year, but he was an active, you know, ally and painting and making it happen in Tijuana uh, for the first phase. Um, he's part of the uh, Deported Veterans Group, and they are working on, you know, proposals and legislative work, and they have like the main tools to, you know, really propose something that would bring relief to many communities, not just the Deported Veterans. So. I think looking at the work that he is doing and then the people that he collab collaborates with is really important, especially now that with the election results, we mostly all, I would say, feel some type of relief that, okay, well, at least this other madness will stop at a given moment, but we still have so much work to do because at the end of the day, we have to acknowledge that when you know Obama was president, um, we had massive deportations, right? That's what he's known for deporter in chief. But now with Biden, knowing that he was his VP, we need to really keep him accountable for all the acts that happened when Obama was president, because at the end of the day, those things follow him. But I think it's really important to see what work is happening beyond the border and to really bring those in. And if someone shares a petition like, hey, sign this, let's do it. Like, let's read it. And if you, you know, um, basically align with the values that they're sharing, like share it. And I'll share something, I'll share a link with you all as well. And I hope that that link is shared with anyone who was part of the webinar. And it's something that Robert Rebat is working with. Um, so this petition specifically, they need X amount of signatures and then maybe someone will listen to them. So I think it's really important to see what work they're doing, not just what academics are proposing, but the people on the ground, because they are the ones who are experiencing, experiencing this day by day and can't dis disconnect themselves from from the work. Um, but I'll definitely look for that and then I'll add it in here. But I would love to hear from you all, like what is it that you all imagine or envision, you know, now being part of this fellowship and seeing that the election results, you know, work the way that they did. And, you know, I just wanna see like, what is it that you all would love to see change? Like if we could imagine something that could potentially happen, like how would that even look like? And then I'll look for that link right now and share it. Yeah, so I could share first. Um, I'm like excited for like the results and stuff, but I'm honestly really scared just because like in the Central Valley, you have pos people's in position of power that, you know, like I always say like we're the other California because like everyone thinks of like California being the blue state and like being progressive, but like people from the Central Valley know that that's, that doesn't really apply to the Central Valley because of like all the farm, like all the farmers and like all like the corporations that dominate this region. And um, it's just scary because like now I'm just like looking out for like lifted pickup trucks and like Trump, like anything. And it's, it's scary. But um, I think like my vision for the Central Valley is to like get people that are usually left out of movement work which is like people that, you know, have, you know, criminal records that have been formerly incarcerated that that are system impacted. So for me is like, cause I come from like that demographic. So for me, I would really want um, folks like in the Central Valley to, you know, really uplift our most criminalized people and to like, you know, start like at, at the end of the day, like the most oppressed people are people that are not in like the fight or like really like people don't even want to mess with them because it's like oh you know like oh if you're a gang member like oh like even our own community like shames these people right so for me my vision is like to empower people that are usually left out of the movement work and to really you know be like you know what you don't need a degree you don't need you know to be really academically inclined for you to be somebody you know so for me that's really my vision is like really tapping into like that 
urgency that young people have because I have like I live breathe like live every day to empower young people right and like for me that's just like like just what I want <laughs> like I just want you know brown black kids to walk down the street without like having to check if there's a cop you know like that's really just like like I just want like folks to be able to hang out kick it and not like having to like you know be do this grand thing but to really like understand that having joy and like being happy like it shouldn't be like it shouldn't cost us like the world to just like be able to breathe okay just to like not feel um you know just like targeted all the time so that's like kind of my vision for your, <clears throat> hopefully this upcoming like post election <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And I think um, just to make like a quick note, um, we should look at how our parents or ancestors organized. Um, I come from a dad who's organized and thanks to his work and labor, his own pueblo back in Mexico called Mezcala, like they work to get roads there and like have access to tech. So I think like learning and how they made it happen without a college degree, without finishing like high school, even like what elementary, I think that's always really important. Like you don't need to have education. Yes, that's beautiful and that helps uplift to a different level, but we have to start and see, you know, what really works. So I love that. I can go next really quick. Um, like what I'm hoping from this post-election and like from Biden's and everyone within that is that they have more recognition of what's going on, not just like what's going on in California, but all around, um, because there's people who have needs that are not being met, um, especially people of color. And, um, you know, everyone's having their own issue. So I know he, he, in his campaign, he does talk a lot. And like, it's just, there's little things that people need help with. You know, every, every person of color has an issue that needs to be dealt with, you know, Hispanic community with immigration, Black, pe black um, people with the holding with the policing, especially Native Americans just trying to get recognition from being who they are. Like, every, that's like my issue, you know, like, and, like everyone has their own issue. So I hope they recognize what's going on and they can help fix everyone's <laughs> issue. Even, you know, like it's just from Trump's administration, administration to now has been hopefully going to be a lot better with his. So like, I hope his admission, sorry, tongue tie can be recognized what's going on. Um, that's going like the real issue. Yeah, and I'll just add a quick note to that, um, Cecilia, and I think it's really important to see how, you know, like Native Americans or people from like different vulnerable communities, right, that we would say, um, who might not be like in the forefront of like, yes, we know that people need housing relief or like food insecurity, but who is it that we really target when we talk about these things, right, or who is like the main population we target and say, okay, well, that's fixed. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that there's so many different people that need this type of support and to really see what is it that they're doing, you know, on the ground to make it happen and how can we, you know, multiply that to really, you know, um, make it work for everyone if possible. So I think that's really important as well. Uh, I can quickly make a comment. So I'm a very hopeful person. And first of all, the fact that we don't have Trump in the White House anymore is very grateful for me. <laughs> so even though like, yeah, we have a new president now, uh, like there still needs to be a lot of talk around with youth and older people, like talking about the issues that needs to be discussed and the issues that involves like different communities, like it still needs to be talked about and like, Dicks. Ah. So I'm just really hopeful that the fight and the drive to like better our community continues and that everything will be somewhat better in the next four years. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I think it's really important. So if we learn something with the Trump administration, and it might sound horrible to also say, but is that, or even with like the pandemic, is that it has highlighted all the things that are wrong, all of them. And then also the mindsets that really go beyond just what will benefit me as an individual, but not caring for how my decisions or who we elected affects people who can't even vote, for example, or who don't have a voice in that sense. So I think it's really important that we don't become comfortable now that we say, okay, well, Biden. But let's remember like when the Democrats were in 
in office. So it doesn't matter which party is in office. Bad things still happen. So we need to move beyond that to say that I'm red or I'm blue. No, like that doesn't work here. Like we need to realize that we are a country and our system demands us to elect someone that represents a set of like ideals, but that we all have to work together because at the end of the day, if I have it okay, then doesn't mean that someone else does. And I think that's really important to to note. So I, I definitely second that, Maria. And I think that it's really important to continue working and to use that same, you know, energy that we had before, but to feel less stressed. <laughs> I think that would be the, the best way and to work together and continue advocating for our communities and everyone else. So yeah, I definitely hope that people don't just dim their light and just become complacent again. Um, it is 7.22. Um, so just to can kind of conclude what's going on, um, I do want to thank you, Lizbeth, uh, for um, in educating all of us today, especially with your project and everything's going on. And I do hope your project it, um, expands and does like a lot more. Um, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today and watching and commenting and like asking questions. This, this always brings great knowledge out. Um, but thank you so much, everybody. So before we go, I want to say thank you also. And I think someone has like closing remarks, but I'll leave my email and then also my website and for you to be able to contact me or if you need a copy of the PD, um, the PowerPoint, I could always send it to you as well. And I'll make sure to share with the organizers to, to share it as well. So you could have that material there as well. But thank you. And I really love talking to you all in this panel and just learning from your insights as well and like your questions. Uh, I think that's really valuable as well. Thank you, Elizabeth. So, do I? Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you, uh, Lisbeth, for this wonderful presentation. And um, just to wrap up, uh, so we've discussed uh, beautiful things about uh, the murals in Tijuana. And we look forward to hearing, um, you know, what next steps you take with this project, where you take it either. Uh, over there in Tijuana, uh, a second stage, or if this starts to merge into different cities. So please, uh, please keep us posted. Um, in the name of uh, PVI, Pan Valley Institute, and uh, the College of Arts and Humanities at Fresno State, we want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Artivism Fellows, uh, for your uh, moderation of this event. And yes, good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>